faculty fellow at Harvard University. Arthur Brooks is going to be speaking on love and reconciliation, and his talk will be followed by questions and answers. Thank you, Father. What a delight it is to be with all of you um, right here in beautiful Napa. Well, that's not true. Um, I'm in my Zoom studio here in Wabin, Massachusetts, but I love to be with those of you who are, who are watching and faithfully following the incredibly important work of the Napa Institute. For all of you who are supporters of the Napa Institute, thank you for doing that. Um, it's, you're tr providing a tremendous service, not just to us who are uh, faithful Roman Catholics, but people all over the country, people all over the world, in point of fact, just based on what you saw in the video before. Uh, so please keep doing that, and, uh, and thank you for being here with me this evening. The topic of my short talk is finding hope. People are pretty hopeless today. I, I don't want to admit that, but I have to say it's true. I write a column for The Atlantic magazine. I was just looking at data for my column about how, what percentage of people think that the world's getting better versus what percentage think the world's getting worse. Only 6% of Americans think that the world's getting better. 65% think the world's getting worse. The world's getting richer. The world's getting more prosperous. We're consuming more and more, but only 6% of Americans think the world's getting better. Why is that? What do we need? No, more importantly, what can each of us do today to start turning that around so that we can feel better and we can create an ecosystem of greater happiness where other people do as well, which will be our apostolate. My answer to that question starts with a mystery that goes all the way back to 1969. In 1969, President Nixon was uh, asking us, so soon after he was inaugurated in January of 1969, asked the simple question, why are we losing the war in Vietnam? It was a huge policy mystery. And the United States had overwhelming military force, had better training, better equipment, better soldiers, better everything but it was going poorly. So he empowered a congressional delegation to go to Vietnam to find out the answer. They came back in a month with an answer. And there were a whole bunch of answers about morale, about culture, but more than anything else, what shocked him and what they believed could be the biggest answer to the reason why we were performing so poorly in the war in Vietnam was that they found that 20% of active duty American military forces were addicted to heroin. Now, this was a huge shock, but it's, it was also incredibly disheartening because nobody then, and still really nobody now, knows effectively how to uh, achieve cessation from opiate addiction on a permanent basis. Heroin is literally the most addictive substance in the world. 20% of active duty military forces addicted to it. Now, quickly the conversation turned to not just why the war is going poorly, but what's going to happen when these thousands and thousands and thousands of guys come home? We're going to have a major crisis on our hands in our towns and in our cities. So they got some recommendations. They did what we who teach at policy schools and think tanks do always do. We put together, you know, a 10 point, we, they put together a 10 point plan about drug interdiction and, and, and policing and you know, criminal justice and public health and you name it. And then they waited for the guys to come home and brace themselves. And they finally came home and nothing happened. Nothing happened. 95% of the drug addicted men who came home from Vietnam spontaneously stopped using the drug on their first day back. And only 10% of them ever used drugs ever again. Nobody had ever seen anything like it ever before in the annals of drug addiction history. So what happened? Well, here's what we know now based on more modern science. What they lacked was a neurotransmitter called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the neurotransmitter that's produced by the human brain when you feel love, when you have eye contact and touch with somebody that you love. You have an explosion of it in your brain the first time you lay eyes on your, your newborn infant. I remember the first time that I, you know, my wife was giving birth to our first son and they, they, they asked me if I wanted to help, which that was due to the father, but basically they're trying to keep you out of the way so you don't faint on your wife. And, uh, and he was born, he just graduated from college, but it only feels like yesterday. And they put him in my arms and he looked up at me with his little eyes and something burst in my brain. That was oxytocin. It's intensely pleasurable. Well, if you've ever asked a heroin addict what heroin feels like, he or she will tell you, it feels like pure love. 
Why? Because opiates actually stimulate the same parts of the brain as oxytocin. And if we're not around people that we love, if we don't have love in our lives, we will take the chemical substitute. When they came back from Vietnam and were united, reunited with their wives and their parents and their friends and their children, they didn't need the chemical substitute and they stopped. The answer to what they needed, the answer to what we all need, is more love. My great mentor was a, a really visionary professor. His name was James Q. Wilson. Some of you know the name. He wrote a great book called The Moral Sense. And he, he sat on my dissertation committee when I was finishing my PhD, and he was on the board of the American Enterprise Institute, where I was president for a long time. He died in 2012, and I spoke at his funeral. And he was with me at every major step in my career. And one time he said, don't forget that policy only affects people at the 5% margin of their lives. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, you know, you could have told me that before I got my PhD in public policy. And then I asked the obvious question, Jim, what's the other 95%? And he said, mostly just love. <laughs> Is he right? Is 95% of how people react to everything based on love? There's a study that I refer to a lot these days that I really like a lot. It's called the Harvard Grant Study. It was started looking at, a, you know, looking at, at the graduates of Harvard University between 1939 and 1944, and it followed them and their families now for 83 years. It wanted to know what's the difference between people who got old and died happy and healthy and mentally healthy and those who didn't. What was the, what was the difference? What was the difference between those two groups? And we know the answer. The director of that study is a man named George Valiant. He wrote a wonderful book called Triumphs of Excellence. And, and here's what he says. You want to know the difference between people who die happy and people who don't? Love. Happiness is love. Full stop. Those are the five words that sum up the whole research across now 83 years. Happiness is love. Full stop. Love of parents predicts happiness and success and love of their adult kids and romantic love and deep friendship. It turns out it's the same thing that the guys from Vietnam found, the same thing that my mentor told me. Now here's the problem. Love is in decline. Love is in decline in America and love is in decline around the world. How do I know this? I'm a social scientist and I've been looking at the data on love. Cigna, which is a big health insurance company, a big health provider, has now uh, started an entire unit dedicated to loneliness. Imagine this. I mean, a health insurance company, they don't do stuff out of charity. They do things because they want to lose less money. And they found that loneliness is a major public health crisis in America today. They have a research division led by a bunch of doctors and, and, and data scientists, and they find that Today, for the first time, 46% of Americans say they always feel alone. 27% of Americans rarely or never feel as though anybody really understands them. 43% of Americans sometimes or always feel that their relationships are not meaningful and they're isolated from others. I could go on, but you get the picture. These are huge numbers. This is evidence that people don't have enough love in their lives. Here's something that freaks me out a little bit more. I'm not gonna lie. There's a social psychologist who teaches at San Diego State University. Her name is Jean Twenge. Some of you have heard of her because she's famous for her work on social media. This is what she's gotten most well known for, showing that social media actually raises depression, raises, raises anxiety. She implicates social media use in the explosion of suicides among women and girls between 15 and 25 years old. Obviously, this is getting a lot of play, and it's something we all need to be paying attention to. But she does another series of studies that has gotten a little bit less attention, but that I think is actually just as important. She has found in her research a major decline in romantic activity among young people, especially among millennials, people who are between the ages of about 25 and 35, and Gen Z, the one right behind them. So my kid's age. Major lack. She finds, for example, that when I was a, a high schooler, a senior in high school, for example, the chances were about 85% that I'd go on a date my senior year in high school. This year, it's 56%. <laughs> An almost 30 percentage point drop in the likelihood of going on a date. Now, 
as the father of a high school senior daughter, I'm like two thumbs up, right? But let's be honest here. That's not the life in life. There's 50% less marriage among people who are in their 20s. And, and by the way, lest you're thinking, well, it's because they're all libertines, they're all living together. No, they're not. They also have a 50% less likelihood of living together, which is good, but you get my point. Hmm. There's less love. There's a third less likelihood today of somebody in their 20s being in love than there was when I was in my 20s. What's going on here? Now, if you're not getting enough of something, the answer is almost always to look at its opposite because you're getting too much of that. Something is crowding out love. What crowds out love? What's the opposite of love? Look to St. John the Apostle, 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. He's asserting that fear is the opposite of love and we have too much fear. Huh. Lao Tzu, the father of Confucian thinking on the other side of the world, 500 years earlier, wrote, through love one has no fear. This is a solid philosophical, theological, and psychological principle, and it has chemical validation. Remember our old friend oxytocin, the neurotransmitter? Studies are showing with, with great abundance of data that actually when you're fearful, if you get oxytocin with eye contact or touch with a loved one, you will calm down the amygdala, the part of your brain that actually stimulates fight or flight. When a, when a woman has a baby and she's anxious, when the baby starts to nurse, the fear tends to decline because of the oxytocin that floods her brain. So let's ask ourselves, what's causing all this fear? If we've got a, look, we have a, a, a hopelessness problem, which is because of a lack of love, which is because of too much fear, <laughs> like Sherlock Holmes here, what's causing the fear? I asked my friend, Jonathan Haidt, the social psychologist at New York University. I asked, he, he's a specialist in fear among young people. And he has all these data that show that people are, the young people are more fearful than they've been of rejection, of threats, of everything. And they have this kind of new religion on college campuses. They call it safetyism. I don't feel safe when I hear a lot of you on the campus saying what you think, for example. Not safe. What's that all about? It's about fear. I said to him, why are young people so afraid? Whose fault is that? And he said, you know what he said? He said, it's your fault. I said, what did I do? He said, how old's your daughter? I said, 17. He said, how old were you the first time that you went out of the house to do an errand by yourself? Walk to school, go to the store for your mom? I said, I don't know, five. He said, how old was your daughter? And I said, I don't know, 14. He said, that's why young people are afraid, because we've never exposed them to the pathogens of life, and they don't have the antibodies. And so they're fearful because they've never been able to build up courage. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You think about the crazy things that you did when you were a kid that you would never let your kids do. Well, that's a mistake. I remember doing a paper route at 4.30 in the morning in my, in my, in my, my neighborhood in Seattle, Washington. It's a working class neighborhood in Seattle. It was a little marginal. There's a lot of crime. It wasn't super dangerous, but, but in the early 70s or the mid 70s at this time, there was this, this craze, this fear you know how we have moral panics in America all the time. The moral panic at that point was about serial killers. It was all in the news and everybody was, every mother was afraid that her kid was gonna get snatched by a serial killer. So I remember my mother saying to my dad, should we let Arthur be walking around at 4.30 in the morning by himself? He might get snatched by a serial killer. I read about one in the paper. Now, it's no joke actually. Ted Bundy had been prowling my neighborhood a few years earlier, okay? And my dad, now, my dad had a PhD in biostatistics. He was a scientist and he knew the data. And at first he tried this line because he was trying to let me keep the paper out. He said, well, you know, even the weirdos have to sleep sometime. But my mom was having none of that. So then he said, he, this is a classic. He said, look, I got the data and Arthur doesn't fit the core demographic characteristics of a serial killer's victim. So I think we should let him keep the route. And I got to keep the route. My daughter wouldn't have kept the route. You get my point. Now, there's a special problem that's creeping in these days, which gets us to the main point. There's about politics today. There's a whole branch of psychology dedicated to 
dedicated to a very strange idea called motive attribution asymmetry. That's the case in which you have a conflict between two people or two groups, and both groups believe that they are motivated by love, but the other side is motivated by hatred. They both think that. Now, when that happens, there's no possibility of agreement or reconciliation, because if I'm motivated by love and you're motivated by hatred, there's nothing I can do to talk to you. If we both think that, we'll never get together. Well, three psychologists at the Northwestern University were looking at this phenomenon, and they found that for the very first time, that the left and right, the Democrats and Republicans in America, have the same level of motive attribution asymmetry as the Palestinians and Israelis. What does this lead to? Fear of each other, hatred toward each other, and inability to love each other, and political polarization, the hopelessness, the inability for us to talk to each other, to understand each other, to come together on on anything, my friends, if you don't like the political climate today, there's too much fear, which means there's not enough love. So here are my assignments as I close. See, I, I get to talk to a lot of young people today, and every year I do a graduation speech or two. Here's my advice. Number one is I recommend that people make their love overt. If there's not enough love, let's start easy. I ask people to, with the people around them, with their friends, or with their family, with their parents, to say these words, I love you, and to get used to it. And a lot of people in their relationships in their lives, they don't say that very often, or, or never, and it's uncomfortable, and maybe it's scary, but just to practice it. That's kind of elementary school uh, 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 practices for getting more love and getting over fear. Because really what it's doing is warming them up for college level fear avoidance or college level love acquisition. And that's actually helping people to confess their love for somebody who doesn't know it, especially their romantic love. It's funny, I was giving a speech about how to be a true life entrepreneur. A life entrepreneur is somebody who puts her or his heart at risk <laughs> and for, for, for an explosive reward. And that means falling in love and being willing to be rejected, if that's what God wants. And so I was talking about this on Capitol Hill to a group of young people in their 20s who, you know, they're not dating, they're, they're, they're not in love, they're not, I got the data. And afterward, a guy comes up to me, actually I saw him two weeks later, he, he approached me on an airplane, it was just serendipity, and he said, I saw that speech you gave about having a startup life by confessing my romantic love, taking a big risk. And I can't get it out of my head. And I said, yeah. He said, I'm on my way right now to confess my love to a woman named Grace in Philadelphia that I've been in love with for two years and she doesn't know it. And I said, it's only a speech, man. <laughs> I didn't want him to ruin his life, but you know, I said my rosary for him that night, I can assure you. I didn't hear from him. Then I ran into him about four months later at a Christmas party in Washington, D.C. And I went running up to him because I remembered him. I said, do you remember me? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, oh, boy. So what happened with Grace? And he said, she shot me down. And she introduced me to her new boyfriend, and it was horrible. And I was very contrite. I said, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I, I didn't mean to give you bad advice. He said, no, no, no. I've been meaning to email you to thank you. See, that was the thing I was most afraid of in my life, and it happened, and I didn't die, and I'm not afraid anymore. That's the advice that I give young people today. Go for it. Get rejected. Become courageous. But here's the advice I give all of us, because this is really graduate level stuff of how to get over fear and get more love, and that's to, to read the Gospel of St. Matthew is fifth chapter, 44th verse. Love your enemies. The most subversive teaching by our Savior, isn't it? But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. It's good advice, it's practical advice because nobody in history has ever been insulted into agreement. But it also feeds your heart what your heart needs. Your heart needs you to love your enemies. It doesn't mean you agree with your enemies. It doesn't mean you acquiesce to your enemies. You can go hammer and tongs with your enemies, but you must love them because you need to love them. And only then will you be effective in the way that you deal with your enemies. And only then 
Only then will the hopelessness start to leave us. Others will see you. Everybody watching us is a leader. And then when they watch your leadership loving your enemies, then we have a fighting chance of taking the apostolate of Christianity, of the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and putting them into practical action in America and around the world today. You get to do it. I get to do it. But you got to remember to do it. Here are my closing words. I want to just give you a quick little quote, something that gives me a lot of inspiration on this theme. It's from St. Jose Maria Escrivá, the founder of Opus Dei, in a, in a speech that he gave at the University of Navarre in 1967. It's a speech called Passionately Loving the World. I assure you, my sons and daughters, that when a Christian carries out with love the most insignificant everyday action, that action overflows with the transcendence of God. Heaven and earth seem to merge, my sons and daughters, on the horizon. But where they really meet is in your hearts when you sanctify your everyday lives. Hmm. Passionately loving the world indeed. Are we up for it? We deserve it. What we need to do. God bless you. God bless the Napa Institute. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for your apostolate. Back to you, Father Ambrose. Thank you so much, Arthur. That was super inspiring. I love the, I love how your, your Zoom studio just brings out the best in you, I think. And I have a question I, I can't neglect to ask. The first question comes from Tim Bush. So we have a number of people uh, asking questions in real time as they're listening to you or watching you. Tim writes, Arthur, thank you for your participation in our virtual Napa Institute tonight. You have been a previous great contribution to the Institute and our mutual friend, Hank, uh, Frank Hanna and I are deeply grateful for your support. Nice. Your book, Love Your Enemy, was amazingly clear and Christian. Okay, and the question, how have you found your Harvard colleagues welcoming you who may have a different political perspective? And that's mirrored by another question that came in from a man named Mike. Is it difficult to be a faithful Catholic at Harvard? Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you for that. Thank you, Tim. God bless you. You're visionary work has led to the Napa Institute, and we're also deeply appreciative of your work as a faithful Catholic and living it out every day. Um, so teaching at a modern university today, um, nobody says it's not tricky. Nobody says that there aren't challenges. And, and part of the reason is just because there's a mildly authoritarian environment in the ideal world in general, whether you're in politics in Washington or you're in a a company in Silicon Valley or, or, or in, in, a, in a university. We just don't tolerate very much a diversity of ideological viewpoints. We're horrible at it. So it makes it hard. And, and everybody's worried about cancel culture all the time. But I have to tell you that I haven't experienced it. On the contrary, one of the reasons that people brought me to Harvard University is precisely because I have a, a different viewpoint. And one of the things that I've noticed is that while there is a lot of campus activism, it's generally not fomented very much by senior experienced faculty, certainly not at Harvard. Most of them are enlightenment thinkers. They believe in a, I mean, they have a strong point of view that doesn't happen to be mine as a general rule, but they believe in a, a pluralism, a competition of ideas. And what they recognize is that we have, a, we have a responsibility to share that with our students. Now, it's an, more of an uphill battle when you're, when you're a conservative. It's a little bit harder. <laughs> it's a little bit harder in Washington, D.C., whether you're on the right or the left than it has been in the past. But, but that's, look, th that's the best opportunity as far as I'm concerned. I mean, when, to, to be a Catholic and or, 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 and or, in my case, also a political conservative at Harvard University, it's an exciting adventure. You know, it's funny. I, my, my, I mentioned my great um, inspiration and, and mentor, James Q. Wilson, before. When I was first coming up for tenure as a faculty member at Syracuse University, um, I was publishing a lot in the Wall Street Journal, and I'd published some things that were more politically conservative than would typically be the case for a faculty member, a lot more, as a matter of fact. I mean, I'm just, you know, about democratic capitalism, which really pulled billions of people out of poverty around the world, thank God. And, uh, and I got protested at some place that I went, just, just a little thing, but it, it chilled me because I was coming up for tenure. So I called Jim Wilson, and I said, Jim, how can you survive as, an, uh, as a conservative in academia? And he laughed, because he's a big conservative and he'd been 25 years at Harvard and 15 years at UCLA and, and done just fine. And he said, it's simple. I said, what's the formula, Jim? He says, the formula is you have to be twice as productive and four times as nice as your colleague. I thought to myself, you know, 
that's not a bad standard to be held. You can say, it's unfair that I have to be held to higher standards, but you know what? Being a Christian is to be held to higher standards, isn't it? And I kind of value that, I have to say. There are days when I wake up with a slightly heavy heart, but more days where I wake up and I say, I'm up for this adventure. Thank you, Lord, for giving this, me this adventure. Thanks a lot, Arthur. That's a, I think there, that answer provided that model of love casting out fear, right? If your example there in your context at the university or in Washington, if you can wake up and say, okay, I'm gonna let love cast fear out of my heart, then it's going to be a model for those who are witnessing that in you. So thank you very, very much. Thank great, it's been a great pleasure, Arthur. Let's, uh, let's uh, close now and uh, move on to the next presentation. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Father. And thanks to everybody who's watching.